Ta-da. OK, we have started the recording. This meeting is now being recorded. <laughs> and this is the, uh, the net zero uh, subcommittee for the school building committee um, here in Amherst. Um, and uh, I, I'm the, the, the chair of the subcommittee. I'm Jonathan Salvin. I'm just going to call on the other members of the committee that are the subcommittee that are present uh, to make sure they can hear and be heard. I'm, just, I'm going to go in the order I see them on the screen, which for me is uh, Kathy. Yes. And Rupert. Uh, yes, I hear you loud and clear. Great. Um, and so with that, I would like to bring up today's agenda. It should pop up here. Somehow it's. <laughs> there it is. Um, and, oh, I've neglected to, to introduce the, the NISCO team, but um, which is the next kind of uh, point on our agenda, but I will do that momentarily. I'm just going to quickly walk through so folks have an overall sense of, of what's going to happen today. Um, so uh, in a moment, I'll have Donna introduce her team. Um, they will walk us through their presentation. Um, then we'll have some discussion. And um, what I would like to do is kind of open up the, the, the public comment at that uh, item number three, uh, the discussion point, so that, that I'm sure our audience will have some uh, comment on what they've heard today. Um, and then uh, after that, we'll, we'll close that, that discussion and, and uh, move on to the, the final uh, agenda, which will, item, which will really be <laughs> when we'll meet again. Um, and with that, I will uh, let uh, Donna have the floor. Oops, but she's Thank muted. you. Yeah, I know. I've got three screens and the mouse can't <laughs> find itself sometimes. So good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, we'll just go ahead and introduce us. We have um, Denisco uh, Thornton Thomas Setti with us, who's our sustainable engineers and consultant, and Samoon O, oh, who will introduce himself. He's with BAV and our mechanical engineer. So with that, Donna Denisco, Rick. Okay. Rick Rice. Oh. <laughs> And we have Vivian. Vivian Lowe, good morning. Tim. And Tim. Good morning, Tim Cooper. Colin. Yeah, I'm Colin. And then with Thornton Thomas Setti, we have Vamshi. Yep, Vamshi Vijay with Thornton Thomas Setti. And we have Sunny. Hi, Sunny Do with TT. Oh, sorry, you guys go by TT, sorry. And then oh, we have, nice. that's okay, that's okay. And, and then we have Simone. Hi. I'm a mechanical engineer. And that wraps up our team. So I think at this point, we probably switch the screen share. Yeah, I'm just trying to take it down. OK. And if we are ready, I'm just going to roll right into it. Go for it. Oh, there's Ben. Uh, does everybody see my screen? Yep. Yep. Excellent. So um, we're just going to start with a slide you've seen before that breaks down the different facets of what are going to get you to our EUI target and the real target, which is a net zero building. And today, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about the different components and how they contribute to that target and what that target is and how that target is a little bit fluid depending on some of the other decisions that we make in terms of the project going forward. Uh, but with that as an introduction, I'm just going to turn it over to Vamshi to move through with the presentation. So we want to just kind of walk you through um, some of the UI targets and potential conservation strategies that we will be considering as we are developing the design. Um, as you can uh, imagine, the first and foremost step is for us to set a target that we have been talking about, 25 EUI. Um, I may have repeat, uh, said this earlier, but EUI stands for energy use intensity, which is basically energy use used in a year uh, normalized over the uh, square footage of the building. So 25 UI is what um, 
we have been referring, and this is this aligns with uh, the Boston uh, Planning and Development Agency's net zero energy targets as well. And we also want to um, acknowledge that in our last uh, call or meeting, we talked about why why don't we push it down even further. Um, in there is ASHRAE Energy um, Advanced Energy Design Guidelines which talks about even lower than 25 EUI for schools. Um, but that said, you know, there are some assumptions made in that guide guidelines um, with user behavior. And, you know, we don't want to, uh, you know, st start there, but we want to have like continued conversations on user behavior on the project. Um, as a design team, we are obviously going to be focusing on delivering a billing that is going to be the most efficient with other parameters consider like costs and life cycle cost analysis, maintenance and those kind of issues that we'll talk about. Um, what you see in the bottom left chart is from the advanced energy design guideline, what they are targeting for our climate zone, which is 5A is 5.5 EUI for just heating and cooling. And the right side is a project that um, we are working on which is going for zero net energy in the same climate zones and MSBA project. Um, as you can see, we are at 5.3, so we are really pushing it down. Um, where we need the conversations um, need to happen is in that the bottom one, which is the big part of that bar chart, which is user behavior, um, about almost uh, a third of the energy use, um, which uh, it requires engagement of the occupants, the maintenance staff, and this is a paddle effort. We can continue to talk about it. But for the purposes of this discussion, you know, we will start with some of the design elements that we are looking at, um, which would be in the next slide, Tim, if you can move there. So as Tim has mentioned, you know, we're obviously working with the flu target but 25 is our goal and we will be trying to push um, push lower and more efficient um, but what you see here are the assumptions or the strategies that we have used in one of the ZNE school um, again this we are not stuck to these measures we if we push in one area we have to pull another area um, so there is some trade-off that needs to happen. But some of the things that I'd like to highlight here is operational hours. Um, you know, obviously, the more the billing is used, the more energy it's going to use. The less you use, the less energy it's going to use. So we want to be cognizant of that. That's a huge piece. We will continue to have the discussion with you as we develop our energy models so that we are giving you the right information. Um, and then we have right from the get-go we are looking at the massing and optimizing the billing orientation so we are uh, harvesting daylight into the space so that we don't uh, use artificial lighting when it's not needed um, and at the same time uh, gather radiation when it's needed and at the same time shade it when it's not needed so those are the initial studies that we'll be conducting um, along with talking about the operational hours we are talking about um, low infiltration this is one thing also we would um, like to uh, really focus on during the design and construction as well because once this uh, is done once the envelope is closed in it's hard to fix it or it's more challenging so we want to do it right the first time um, and we can talk about that in more detail as well and envelope insulation. So this is where we are seeing most of our ZNE schools um, being around. Again, as I mentioned, this is a trade-off uh, studies. If we have some limitation in one area, we'll have to make up for that in some other area. Um, same thing with um, window-to-wall ratio. Um, it's a pretty optimized window-to-wall ratio where we have a good balance of daylight um, and the heat heat losses are minimized, heat gains are optimized as well for uh, heating conditions. And then we have high performance double pane windows and they're thermally broken. 
Um, we'll get into more of that um, with, you know, considering different glazing types and things of that nature, maybe even triple pane, but that has cost impl implications as well. So we'll uh, look at it holistically. Um, lighting systems, you know, then whatever uh, lighting loads we need after harvesting daylight, um, you know, we want to be in the LED world and it's it's a base of design now in pretty much most of the standard schools. That's, although we are listing it as a high efficient system, it is what uh, most of the schools are doing, even if they're not going for net zero. And this is um, really, really bringing the lighting levels down. I mean, we're talking about uh, five EUI as we've seen in the previous chart. Um, and in this case, we are using geothermal decoupled ventilation system and high efficiency uh, energy recovery wheels. Again, geothermal is not the silver bullet here. Um, you know, we will evaluate the heat pump system, the VRF system, which is air source. It could be water source as well. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, it's if you are taken away in one place, we have to add another place. But th this way, we're not stuck to these parameters that we are looking at on the screen. Uh, low flow toilet fixtures, these are um, have not as much impact on the overall EUI, but you know every BTU saved is like every BTU gained for us. So we want to make sure we are putting our attention on everything possible in the building. Um, and exterior lighting is going to be LED. That is, again, a, a standard approach nowadays. So, so, these are, so yeah, Bam, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to pause after we wrap up the slide to have a conversation about it. Yeah, yeah. So this is not a comprehensive list of things that we'll be looking at it. Um, oh, this is mainly to show the low hanging fruits and where we will have most impact and a couple of them which we want to just highlight. So, yeah. so with with all that, you know, there are aspects in this that we do automatically with all of our projects, right? Um, the envelope, low infiltration, um, the double pane windows, LEDs, low flow toilet fixtures, like some of those are givens and, and those we don't necessarily need to focus on. Um, the envelope insulation, you know, there's a diminishing return. The more you put in doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna gain more. So you know, the R40 for roof and R25 for walls is kind of the sweet spot. Um, but, but beyond that, I think, you know, as Vamshi identified, the operational hours are key. And that has a huge impact on the use of the building, right? Not only for um, user behavior, but it also has impacts on the system, and, and everything else that goes into it. And we know that this school is going to be a huge community resource. So we really, I've um, circulated an hours chart um, yesterday to understand what the anticipated usage will be from a school perspective. So we understand that, you know, um, summer, if you have summer school, this is going to be probably used if you do have a summer school or if you have summer programs. Uh, for some of your special ed programs, that this will obviously be the preferred school to use, I, we would imagine. So all of this is really going to play into it. And that's why, um, you know, when, when these white papers come out and say, no, you really want to be a 25 EUI, okay, but these are the parameters more or less that you need to achieve. And sometimes it just isn't possible. So again, it's sort of push and pull, the other component, and we've been able to achieve a window to wall ratio of 22 to 24%, but hearing daylighting is important to you. There's a huge impact to that. And then from a cost perspective, um, double pane windows. If, if you know we feel that we need more windows, well, how are you gonna achieve that? Triple pane, but recognizing cost is really important to the community. We, we need to understand those trade-offs and implications. So, you know, we always look at things holistically. You can't talk about things in a vacuum. Um, even, even the HVAC system, as Vamshi alluded to, 
you know, geothermal has the highest first cost, but it's the most efficient. It, it's the most consistent, most efficient that we'll be able to achieve a lower or, or a 25 EUI, provided everything else is, is stated in there. If we go to a VRF system, it utilizes more energy. So what's your trade-off? So this is our goal and we have to work collectively to make sure that first the building is designed for its true intent, which is a school and a community use facility. And then we can talk about the other stuff, right? Um, and how can we achieve that? We could still possibly, you know, we can still achieve net zero without hitting a 25 EUI. So, you know, we understand this is a target and we'll do everything we possibly can understanding there are gonna be some trade-offs and maybe some concessions that we're gonna to have to make, but that still doesn't mean that we won't hit a net zero. So I, um, we're not saying you need 25 to get to net zero. And then the other thing that's really important is that we really don't wanna understate the usage of the building because it's our understanding the bylaw says after a full year of use, you need to verify this. So we don't wanna say, oh, you know, school only is open from eight to 4 p.m. and it's not used in the weekends and it's barely used in the summer, whatever, um, because you, you, you're have, you have to verify it. So we wanna be as honest and upfront as possible um, to make sure that, that not only does it look good before we build the building, but the actual usage is, is accu as accurate as we possibly can. And Donna, if I could just make I'm a comment yep. on that. Yeah. Um, and I, I would encourage you to follow up with uh, Mike Morris to, to get more, you know, kind of definitive information. But certainly pre-COVID, um, our schools have been community resources. There, there's each one of the elementary schools, at least at that time, and I, I maybe ben, ben probably knows it more than I, maybe I should stop talking, but certainly there were before school and after school programs that would have expanded past this this time. And I'll, I'll stop talking and let uh, Ben chime in. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna kind of speak to is that the, uh, eight to four is absolutely not realistic. Right. So we, we have um, after school programs in all of the elementary schools till at least 530. I think one of them gets out at six. We also have custodians in the building until 11 p.m. every night. And then um, like right now we have basketball. I think there's other sports that we also rent out our facilities is, is that's so that kind of skews the time. And then and also the uh, like the summer hours. I'm, I'm just thinking from our department, even without summer school, we have eight hour shifts of custodians working throughout the entire summer. And I think. Actually, no, it's, it's reasonable to, to add that there are like also summer camps that use the facilities. So, and some of these may not be, they use the whole facility, but right. I think we want to think about, because often it'll be the large volume spaces, the gyms, the cafeterias, um, which would probably have somewhat separate systems anyways, but, but identifying those. Um, and Ben, I have a memory and it may just be a bad memory, but before COVID, I thought there were, there were times where, where you would act, the schools would actually be open a little earlier for you know kids to get breakfast and things like that. I don't remember what time that started, but it was certainly before eight. Yeah, yeah, we're we're kind of still on that that program with the free uh, breakfast and lunch and all. So, but yeah, yeah. So this just um, we're putting out the time of eight a.m., but we understand that the school has to be warmed up earlier than that, right? So, so you know, it would turn on at six and maybe now it needs to turn on at five or whatever, but we 100% agree. And that's why, um, to maybe go back to the previous slide. Um, you know, again, the chart on the right, I don't know if you can see that, but in, in order to achieve a 5.5 from the ASHRAE guidelines or, or even how we're gonna achieve it overall, here are the percentages. So we 100% agree. This is a huge investment for the community. It should be used. Um, custodian use is a little different in that, you know, we can do different things for the custodians, such as we can have sensors as they go through the hallways. 
you know, this, the, the lights will come on and then they'll go off or whatever. And we can reduce the amount of airflow needed just for the custodians to be in the building and stuff. But that still doesn't negate the fact that there are going to be people in it, right? Um, so, so 100%, we, and that's why this is, in theory, it looks great. Um, in, in reality, this is a huge conversation to have. So we appreciate it and we're recognizing it. We, we, that's why we're bringing this up. And we wanna you know, collect all of this data and we also wanna project for when this new building or renovation is there, it's ideally going to be used more than it is now, even though it is a fully used community asset. So we wanna you know, make sure that we get the best data possible and make the best projections possible for the use going forward. Yeah, and, and some of the other considerations would be what the technology is going to be in the building, right? That that could drive uh, some of the usage, not as much as probably the energy, but um, that that's an important consideration. And a lot of the equipment, technology, equipment, et cetera, is becoming more and more efficient, but that's a consideration. The other thing is, like you said, Ben, breakfast and lunch, well, the kitchen consumes a lot of energy. So, and so, you know, there's just all of these variables that we appreciate people trying to get in front of this, but the reality is these are community resources and here are gonna be the trade-offs that we have to talk about. So we'll assemble, we've already started the conversation, we'll be assembling the hours. I think we'll share it with you all, but I think we wanna be on the conservative side of all of that, as opposed to saying, Nope, you can't use the building. We're shutting off the lights and turning off the system at 6 p.m. Like we, we, we need to protect and have a buffer, especially because you need to measure this after the school is in use for a year. And this uh, is a good segue to our next slide that shows the relative um, impact on EUI for each of the factors that we're discussing. Mm -hmm. Operational hours is obviously huge and that's uh, the second, well, the largest is geothermal, there's VRF, but that is your heating and cooling load, which is directly related to operational hours. But uh, I'm gonna let Vamshi talk a little bit more about this slide. Well, I just, Tim, can you just go back to the last slide? Did you have, did you guys have any other comments about some of the other kind of categories that we've outlined as far as how to well, achieve? There's, there's a couple of things that you might be good if, for the for for folks you know who haven't gone through the building process before to, to understand uh, you know terms that might not be kind of readily apparent um, maybe just touch on what building massing means as a practical um, uh, item and uh, this one's new to me I don't quite know that I know what decoupled ventilation is um, absolutely. Uh, building massing um, in its simplest terms is the shape of the building. So um, there are a lot of things that are going to contribute to that. Um, what we find to be educationally appropriate in terms of layout, the number of floors. Um, there are also going to be site considerations. Um, maybe on the Wildwood site, uh, you get a taller building because there's a little less room. And so as the building gets more compact, you have less skin and the skin is where you gain and lose your heat. So it has an effect on the energy performance. So that's why that's important. Um, I'm sorry. Talk about and, the, and, and the orientation of the building yeah. as well. And <laughs> we have a little, yeah. And all, I just wanna, as we get into that, all of these factors apply both to a renovation addition and a new building. We have a little less control with orientation on a renovation addition because obviously we'd be using some of the building that's still there. But orientation means um, getting an optimal relationship to how the sun is hitting the building for both um, heating and cooling and glare and the comfort of occupants. Uh, classroom windows that face north and south are preferred. Uh, mm -hmm. North facing windows, there's no direct sunlight typically, so there's no glare and south facing. Uh, when the light is coming in, the sun is higher in the sky, so the light isn't penetrating further into the room and creating glare situations on either desktops or teaching spaces. Um, and then decoupled ventilation, which you asked about, Jonathan, means separating or fennel. I'm sure you want to get into it. Sure, sure. I, I was, I thought you were handing over to me. Um, um, yeah, decoupled ventilation is basically separating 
the ventilation needs and uh, sensible heating and cooling. Um, you know, the building has two types of loads. One is fresh air. We need to bring the fresh air when the people are inside. And then we need air to either heat or cool. So this decoupled ventilation strategy helps us to control the airflow much better. So when there are no people, you can literally shut down all the air needed for, um, for people. So then all you need is the air for actually just heating or cooling whatever you need at that point. Um, there are a significant amount of uh, savings uh, with this kind of control, control strat strategies and a lot of uh, high performance schools right now are adopting this technology um, and it works really great with you know, the heat pump uh, systems that we are looking at, whether it's geothermal or VRF. Um, so that is what decouple ventilation so with that, um, we are, have reached out, I don't know if everyone has seen it, but we do, with that comes sophistication of the systems. And what we want to do is meet with the school department and, and if there are other folks within the um, town that need, we need to talk about these systems, right? There are implications to them. So two, two parts, one is the sophistication of it, the ease of use the um, energy efficiency to them and the other components cost. So you're gonna have, you know, for some of these systems, you're gonna have a higher first cost, but in the end, as you can see, you know, you, you will receive the benefit of that going forward. And we'll get into the life cycle cost analysis, but we wanna make sure that everyone understands that, you know, these are all assumptions. And then we really wanna make sure that the system can be supported by your staff, and, um, and, and we can afford it. Are there any other um, specific items that we just want to elaborate on this slide before we move on? See any hands? Um, and here is where I was going to hand it off to Tom Shea about um, a simple diagram of the impact of all of those factors, uh, both in terms of energy use and also cost is not the same. So some of the items that we're gonna focus a little bit more are, are you know, illustrated with longer bars on this graph and Tom, she can elaborate. Yeah, no, I just was gonna say like, you know, this is sort of like a sensitivity um, test to, you know, each of these parameters can impact the energy use intensity numbers. Uh, some do more than the others um, and but these are some of the items that you may come across when it com uh, comes to building design that people talk about insulation um, you know beyond a certain point as donna mentioned earlier you know there's diminishing returns but also the amount of energy savings you'll not see huge are huge um, then same same way for other um, items that you see building orientation it can impact about half to one EUI building mass, uh, about the same uh, infiltration has a little bit more impact. So what this um, diagram basically uh, tells us is that where should we put our energy into in discussions? Um, if, if, we, if, we, if we have to de dedicate one full meeting, a half day meeting, it would be on geothermal versus VRF system on the system side and operational hours. Um, and then we're not saying the other things are less important. As I mentioned, like every BTU saved is what we are looking for, but it's how we prioritize these um, strategies as we move forward with the design development. De development. Um, anything else to add, either Donna or Tim on this one? Then yeah. we just added um, a discussion of priorities, um, how we're going to um, weigh some of these factors against each other is because they all have cost and they all have um, impact in terms of meeting Amherst's goal. So, I mean, I'm sure these are all important to the project, but the relative importance we have to discuss and figure out meeting all the goals. Obviously, it's going to be net zero capable by the bylaw and just the stated desire of the project. 
um, construction costs and operating costs, um, you know, specifically in terms of geothermal and some of the other systems, um, you know, can contribute to efficiencies, but there is the reality of cost that we have to figure out where our priorities lie. Um, carbon emissions are obviously important. Um, and it is an all electric building, which um, contributes greatly to reducing carbon emissions, but, um, you know, that's site energy. I mean, if we're considering source energy, the more energy we use, there's still carbon. So it's just something that we want to have in the back of our mind. Uh, embodied carbon um, relates to whether or not we're renovating and the selection of materials that we use in a new or renovated building. And then as we put all of these pieces together, um, you know, at the end of the day, this is a building, this is a place where people will spend their time and occupy. So some of the um, systems we're talking about, um, for an example, there's PV over the parking lot or on the roof and how that gets integrated into the site and how the site is used is just one of the many considerations that we're going to have to consider as we move forward. Um, and then Donna touched on the complexity of the system. So earlier rather than later, we want to meet with Rupert and Ben to get their input on what we are designing that can be maintained and used by the facility. Real, real quick on, mm -hmm. that, on, that, on that topic, Rupert has his hand up. Go ahead, Rupert. Oh, I just uh, wanted to comment um, on the, um, the priority regarding infiltration. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the infiltration and exfiltration, at some point it would probably be good to hear from folks about the consequences of those strategies in terms of uh, openable windows uh, how that affects the EUI, what strategies there are to allow that, if it is even allowable with this EUI target. Thank you. Um, the building will have operable windows. Um, I mean, if it's a contributing factor to user comfort, it's actually, uh, you get a lead point. Um, there certainly is infiltration at operable windows uh, that will contribute to heat loss, uh, humidity in the building and energy. <laughs> Um, but we designed the envelope as a whole um, and all of the solid wall between the windows, we like to make it, well, we do make it as tight as possible. Um, so, I mean, it's an overall consideration. So it's just another aspect that you have to balance between, um, you know, getting a high performing um, building and providing a building that is comfortable for the humans that are living in it and that are, going to school and educate. I was gonna just add to Rupert to your question as um, it's a whole building infiltration we're looking at, um, not necessarily when the operable windows are open. Um, I mean, we are looking at intersection of wall and the roof or the floor, or there are utility chases, you know, all these opaque areas, which you wouldn't think there is infiltration. Um, you know, we, we've noticed like, you know, a lot of these areas in the building envelope, not visible quite, but they're still letting the air out or in, uh, depending on you know, whether you're positively pressure or negatively pressurized and which, uh, which time of the year. So the idea behind infiltration is before everything is closed up, do we have a right air barrier and we are attaining a certain level of, um, you know, air tightness in the building so that you're not using losing all this conditioned air through the window to the outdoors. So the more we control that, um, the more efficient the buildings do get. If I could add then to this is not, this is two prongs. This is detailing the air and vapor barriers so that it's tight, but it's also workmanship and observation while it's going on because uh, a lot of infrared scans can show uh, leaks uh, that get buried that are really a workmanship issue in the field. So the simpler you can detail it, the easier it will be in the field to get it tight. Yes, that's, uh, yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I think a really tight envelope makes it much easier to control your energy costs. I just want to point out that uh, with a current emphasis on as much ventilation and fresh air as possible, our energy costs in our current operations have skyrocketed. Um, and so maybe this is really a discussion for um, 
uh, occupant behavior rather than, than the, the envelope. And I suspect, Rupert, there are some options that are probably available in new systems that our existing buildings simply don't have. Um, you know, I, I don't think any of our systems have heat recovery in the ventilation portion, probably. Yeah, I mean, to the point of ventilation too, um, you know, we are also noticing with the whole COVID situation, more and more requests coming for increasing the ventilation so that there are more filtered air coming into the space. So that's another thing to keep in mind how it impacts our energy performance, because um, obviously the more fresh air you bring into the space, um, you have to dehumidify it, condition it, um, and filter it. So that has some energy impact. So we are already looking at it because we have never come across that situation, obviously before, but in the past two years, we have seen that come again and again on, on, this, on our projects. Um, before we go into priorities, yeah, I was just going to also add that, you know, the priorities we have here, you know, there are synergies between all these items that are listed on the screen. Um, obviously, we're not going to look at each of them like in silo, but, you know, whatever we are doing in one part, you know, definitely impacts on the other metric that we are looking at. Um, you know, for example, we know the direct relationship with net zero. Um, capable strategies and their impact on the construction costs, but also it has operating costs, implications, carbon emissions, and whether we use uh, existing building versus new building that has embodied carbon. But what if you use existing building? There is a, a, some constraints we have to work with in terms of upgrading the envelope so it meets that thermal comfort or a thermal performance criteria. So we will be looking at it in a, in a more integrated fashion, uh, all these priorities. Great. So the next slide. So these are um, the next steps um, that we are um, be working right away and trying to get whatever we talked about right now to establish specific um, criteria, optimized design solutions for, um, for the building design again, with uh, in conjunction with discussions that we talked about occupants uh, or the usage schedules and uh, which we will seek your feedback, obviously, as we keep moving forward. But in terms of our analyses and studies, we'll be looking at uh, looking at various sites. I think that um, uh, Tim is Tim and Don are going to talk about shortly here a um, massing comparison that Tim has mentioned what it is. Envelope recommendations, again, optimizing, you know, what is the insulation in the walls versus roof, what type of window systems, what is the glazing to wall ratio or the window to wall ratio, um, and then different HVAC system studies. Again, one thing I would like to highlight here is um, life cycle cost analysis, which we see that should be integral to what we're doing, because whatever decisions we are making will have, you know, financial impact. Um, um, so we want to give you a whole picture. Okay, if you do this one, this is what it means ultimately for the um, billing cost or the pricing. Uh, daylighting, again, uh, to reiterate, daylighting, again, would be an integral part of our analysis and finding that balance point between where we get the good amount of daylight, but at the same time, not uh, losing heat to the outdoors by having Large, larger windows than needed. Uh, so the goal is for us to have um, a, an established base of design for the envelope and HVAC systems, um, which is in the next three months, I believe. Here is a, uh, you know, a graphic representation of the schedule over the next few uh, modules of the. So we're going to issue the PDP in about a month. Um, and at that point, we'll have options um, in terms of program. Well, there's one program, um, but in terms of uh, sites identified and, and all of the background information gathered. 
and then we'll be moving into PSR where we'll have to select a site. Uh, we will be narrowing down massing options. Um, at When we issue the PDP, there will be order of magnitude costs associated with each option, in which we will then develop into life cycle costs for each option with various systems early in PSR. Um, and then that will be developed as we get into schematic design. So um, this basically is just showing you the general sequence of how we're going to narrow in on some of the numbers that we need to get in terms of um, the cost of relative options and relative systems that will allow us to make some informed decisions. Um, as Vamshi mentioned, there will be a basis of design that will be a general description of the entire project um, at PSR, but it will continue to be designed in SD, in schematic design, and then the dash line going beyond schematic design for systems design and envelope um, indicates that they will be tweaked you know, through DD and basically through the entire project. But this is just where some of the decision points are going forward. Um, Tim, if I, if I could just add to that, um, all of these, the pricing, I guess I should almost call it pricing or order of magnitude at PDP and then also at PSR, those are not your final costs of the project with MSBA. However, we wanna be as accurate as we can with the little information we have because once the number is out there, the number's out there. And so, you know, we, we will have those conversations with you all and of course the building committee to develop a strategy as we look at the options and of course look at the mechanical systems, geothermal, VRF, and then if it's geothermal, the actual system, the distribution system for the building. So um, we don't wanna radically stray from what we're presenting you know, at PSR, because we don't want to, to provide the community with an order of magnitude cost and then later change it. So again, we'll have be having these conversations with the school building committee on the best approach is how we provide this information. And, and it, you know, everyone thinks that it should be, it, it is fluid, but we really want to obtain as much information as possible as soon as possible, but it is fluid and it is a little linear. You have to make decisions um, which impact other decisions. So it's a balancing act. But I think um, just to dovetail on that, our goal for the next meeting, Tim, do you wanna? So for our next meeting, which we anticipate to be in about a month, we would take um, the preliminary pricing that we have with PDP and develop that with systems so that early in PSR, um, we could have an evaluation and a comparison of relative costs for each option with each system so that we can make some informed decisions about one, the overall price and what we can include in the project and two, which option is appropriate in terms of siting system and all the other components that go into putting that number. I see Kathy has a hand up before we leave this slide. Uh, yeah, Tim, you mentioned a next meeting about a month from now. Um, is I'm, I'm looking for a more specific date, mainly on this uh, preliminary design program. Would this group meet before that is finalized and sent in? Or would you, you know, I know you're doing the cost estimating now and over the next few weeks. So we're, we're at February 10th. So I, I'm not looking for a specific date, but just uh, before or after we're targeting around March 15th, I think, Donna, for that submission. Um, 
Is that correct? Um, the submission is, is so, yes, sorry, I don't mean to hesitate. The submission to MSBA is, it's, it's a self-imposed date of, of March 15th. That, that's our goal. With that said, we need to have the numbers. Before that, we are going before the community, I believe. No, we're going before school committee on the 8th, community on the 9th, which means all of that needs to be wrapped up by then. And so I, the timing's really tight to be able to come back to this group prior to that to be having that conversation. So again, you know, we, we need to establish a approach to how we want to do order of magnitude when we, when, when we present the PDP numbers. And there might be a range of numbers because every decision has a different implication to the cost. So I, I don't, I, we need the kind of the order of magnitude cost from the cost estimate. And that will be coming literally, it's gonna be hot off the press because they need a couple of weeks to do that, right? So I'm not trying to be no, evasive you had, you here, had, but you were, you <laughs> the answer is probably no. <laughs> you were, no, you were completely clear because okay. it, it helps to, we should focus big questions now because that will influence what you're doing before we see you again. Yeah, and, thank you. Uh, I'll let uh, Margaret go next, but but I just want to make sure I heard something correct, which is that, you know, we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at cost ranges uh, during the PDP process, but also during the PSR process. Um, and the one that's going to have the more um, detailed information on building systems, I thought I heard, would be associated with the PSR process. Yes. And so for this committee, it's probably, we're able to kind of get into it and pick it apart a bit more at that stage. Correct, correct. And, 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 and as well, Jonathan, there's an opportunity to refine all of this during schematic design because we are not locked into a cost with the MSBA until schematic design. Although um, we try to be as close to the actual number that we're gonna to agree to with MSBA at PSR. And there may be some extenuating circumstances that may impact or shift the overall cost of the project. But once a number is out there, we recognize that a big shift in the number is not, not where we wanna be. Yes. So, yeah. And, and you know again, as Vamshi was saying and Tim, there's just gonna be push and pull as, all of the decisions that are being made for all the various reasons to, to arrive at all, all of your priorities. Margaret? Oh, you're muted. I just, yeah, I wanted to provide a little context for estimate, especially for folks um, who are maybe listening in and sort of dipping in and out of this. Um, so the, you know, the, the way to think about the PDP estimate, in, in my opinion, and, and Denisco can chime in and tell me if they disagree, is that it's sort of, it's, it's trying to uh, sort of pin down a likely range, but it, it's really a comparison. The, the purpose of it in the process is to tell the MSBA what, what the options are that are gonna be considered and the, the reason to provide a relative cost is to, at that level, help the community understand how they might compare in terms of cost. So the way it's accomplished is by applying the same set of assumptions about the set of them and totally agreed with what Denisco's team is saying about how the assumptions need to be super conservative because they're so such a small amount of information. So I just wanna make sure for folks listening when they hear estimate, it's, it's really to give a comparative sense of what these options might look like in terms of cost and under, in, with the understanding that there's actually very little drawn at this point. So that was it, that's my screed. 
Vivian? Yep, and just to add to that, um, so because we don't have a design per se yet, but for comparative purposes, a lot of times these, um, these prices are based on square uh, dollars per square foot. But what we do want to um, iterate is that we will pull out costs separately for say PV systems as well as geothermal so that you could see within each given option what those considerations are. And the, the intent is really to provide as much information for you all to make the best decisions at each phase. I think we could probably keep moving forward. We're, we're almost at the one hour mark. So I wanna make sure that we're a sufficient time to kind of open this up to a, a broader discussion. In terms of the presentation, that is it. I mean, we That's did include okay. a couple um, site plans of options, but they haven't been developed and they were really, really just to provide context if the discussion went that way. Sure. Um, I can stop sharing and we can open it up to discussion. Yeah, I do just wanna say, this is a great um, graphic. Uh, Denisco team for what it is to show, help explain the process. So thank you. So Kathy, I'm going to rely somewhat on you uh, and your ability to see who's got hands raised uh, and to, to bring them in. And, and I guess I should probably ask quickly as, as Kathy, looking at that, Rupert and Ben, do you, did you have any other questions, comments uh, at this stage before we, we open it up to the public? Great. Okay, so it, it looks so if people oh. in the public will, so we'll go to Rupert first, and then if people in public raise their hand, I will bring you in one by one while we're, we're taking Rupert's question. Uh, mostly it's just a comment I wanted to um, be a little bit more explicit about the, uh, the massing concept um, and just point out that. Uh, um, a cube would be way more efficient than a long flat rectangle um, or a, uh, uh, some other geometrically uh, regular uh, figure like a, a geodesic dome would be, may more, would be may way more efficient than a, a long single story uh, thing. I just wanted that to be explicit. Bruce, I think you're the, the, the first one. Mute, unmute, so there we go. Um, first of all, um, this is a very uh, uh, confidence building uh, conversation. I am uh, continue to be impressed with the way the committee is absorbing this and dealing with it and also with the team, the way they're presenting it and uh, gradually bringing us forward. I know it's very, very early. I've got all sorts of questions, but I'll, I'll concentrate on three and they'll be, um, uh, uh, the, the, the first has to do with the low infiltration strategy um, or, 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 or um, area. I just wanted to know whether um, this is the, uh, this building will be uh, pressure air tightness uh, tested. Is, uh, uh, I mean, this is a big building. I know we've, we've typically pressure tested uh, smaller buildings routinely. On larger buildings, we partition that sometimes. But uh, as technology has improved, I've heard of uh, larger and larger buildings being done. And I just wanted to know whether it was the intention of the team to do a, a, a one or more uh, air tightness tests on the building uh, uh, for diagnostic purposes, because I heard Rick say, you know, this is a very, uh, um, well, I know these, these envelopes can leak in all sorts of ways. And uh, when I was trying uh, years ago to uh, get design teams and construction teams to pay attention to this, um, the mantra was, you know, it's about doing a hundred or in this case, a thousand things well, any one of which doesn't matter a damn. Um, it's like a bunch of sticks. You can break any one stick. It's, in, it's, it's just totally immaterial, but the aggregate is all important. So it was quite difficult. And one of the ways we did this was to, uh, blow door test these buildings even with smoke testing and so forth so people could see the leaks it got people's attention that really built uh, an appreciation of the value of air tightness and how you get it so 
first question, I've got three, so I hope I could ask them and get an answer. Uh, do you want me to ask them all three at once, or do you want me to stop? Um, I just, if you could ask them quickly, Bruce. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> so that, the question, the first question then is, do you intend to a test, and, and, it, and, and if so, what is your uh, intended uh, ACH fi uh, it, it change uh, at 50 pascals, or maybe you do it at 75, but I guess it's 50. So what is that uh, test standard that you would ideally aim for? Second is uh, my sense of decoupling the ventilation. Um, I, uh, uh, I didn't hear it particularly, but my sense is that you've got separate ducting systems, that the ventilation ducting is independent of the, uh, of the heating and cooling ducting. And I love that because the, the amount of ventilation volume is, is an order of magnitude at least smaller than uh, the heating and cooling ducting. And so if you have an independent ventilation ducting, you've got, you're delivering the, the ventilation air, the fresh air exactly uh, where you're not putting it into an oversized duct so it diminishes and you don't really know where it's going. So I'd like to confirm that uh, decoupled ventilation means that there are two sets of uh, ducts uh, to achieve it. And thirdly, uh, COVID and ventilation. Uh, just, uh, I've been reading uh, uh, some uh, uh, research and reports that have been sent to me by some of my uh, ventilation guru friends, and uh, it became apparent that um, a, a very good strategy may be not just to increase the ventilation to cover COVID, but to uh, maximize smaller in space filtration units and that uh, and if at, at the appropriate time I could uh, send you the papers that I think are the best on this that indicate that uh, the balance of strategies between increased ventilation on the one hand and um, in space filtration on the other for, for and I could go on at length but I won't so those are my two questions and one comment or well, actually yeah two questions and one comment oh and Thank you want to do two and three no, my, my second, my third was not a question. It was the comment about uh, how I think that, or I'm beginning to understand the, the value of filtration. I'd like us, and, and, and I can, I, I, I'll, I'll move, I'll, I'll keep my eye on this as the, as the uh, conversation moves forward into uh, advanced design stages. Thanks for the question, Chris. Maybe I can answer the first one. I see someone raising hand. I'm sure he's talking about the <laughs> ventilation. I'll, I'll passed over to him. Just a little uh, comment on the infiltration air tightness. Um, you know, usually the blur door test, you know, in the past was limited to the small scale buildings, but we are actually looking at a couple of schools where we are compartmentalizing some areas and um, doing the blur door test, pressurizing, and the target, at least, um, some of these schools are still under design or construction. Um, we are targeting 0.7 ACH at 50 pascals, but you know that is just something we need to sit and talk through with envelope commissioning uh, folks. Um, uh, there will be an envelope commissioning agent or a commissioning agent who will also do the envelope. So that needs to, that dialogue needs to happen and we can establish that. But that is what we've been seeing. Um, and then I just wanted to add on the logistics of doing blower door tests on a large building is issues we've run into before. We typically do a mock-up, which is built to the same standard. And then those construction practices can be applied to the entire building as another way of monitoring. And then the mock-up itself is tested. So it's a sort of a redundant testing system. The mock-up is pressurized. It's actually three-dimensional and not just the type of mock-up you might see for uh, window testing. And mm. we've been doing that for a few projects as part of the uh, pre-construction testing of the envelope as it comes together. Thank you. And, and then just to add to that, because I'm always worried about the money, um, MSBA is actually providing a commissioning agent for the project. It's not, um, and they'll pay for it as well. So that is not going to be borne by the town, which is That's enormous. Great. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. That, that said, great. the blower great. door test is paid by the town. And that's, a, again, cost benefit. That's a significant cost for a building this size. Yes, I thought so. 
And then there was the first question, which I don't know that we got to about the decoupling, yep. which would ventilation yeah. would be through ducts. Simone. Simone wanted yeah. De yeah, decoupling means not necessarily uh, separating the ductwork as much as uh, treating the condition there separately. One is like traditional uh, method was that you cool down during the summertime, all, everything down to 55 degrees, which wastes a lot of energy. So decoupling means we just take outside air portion of it and bring it down to dehumidify. So you save a lot of energy doing that. Uh, and when it comes to separation of ductwork, it's a little complex and we could address that once we get to a point where we start uh, deciding what type of HP system we'll be going with. And uh, uh, when it comes to COVID measures, uh, both, uh, as a team, Danesco and I spent probably two years uh, consulting with a various lot of different school districts. And uh, we also could address that more specifically as we define the HVAC system. When it comes to portable uh, system, whether it's HEPA filter, UVC lights, or combination thereof, we recommend that for most times retrofit projects because Fixing the main system is very expensive or well, impractical, but portable system has a lot of issues that you have to be aware of. One is that they're noisy. Yeah. So if you select a system and you can only select for high speed, you can't hear yourself think. So you end up uh, operating at low speed, which is only a fraction of recommended uh, rates. So for the new, if it's new building, we rather just have a central system to take care of everything but we'll probably have a separate presentation regarding the COVID measures. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. And, and just to add to that, bringing it back to the net zero, you know, the, the additional ventilation is also going to increase energy use. So, so really all of these decisions cannot be made in vacuums and everyone has to all understand that there might be some, I don't wanna say compromises, yeah. but agreed upon solutions. No, I, I wanted to know how you were thinking about these three or four things and you've answered uh, perfectly well. Thank you very much. Kathy, do we have any other hands up? Oh, you're muted, Kathy. Sorry. Sarah Eric just raised her hand, but there's no, her until then there was no other hand up. Okay. Um, Thanks. Thanks for all the great work all. Um, a few comments. One, um, so Donna, I, I hear you on the ability to get to net zero at a variety of EUIs by, you know, throwing more PV on the roof and getting there. And yet it's my understanding that the 25 EUI is critical from a utility incentives point of view. So isn't the Eversource program a hard limit on 25 EUI? And I think there's like a buck 75 per square foot on the line for that, right? With additional incentives for verification after the fact. So it, it seems like we wanna be really confident that we're gonna hit 25 uh, and, and not kind of try to make it up with PV otherwise. Is that is that your understanding in kind of the ever source dollars at stake? At uh, actually, um, the last just recently completed project with Eversource still received a significant um, incentive from them. And, and we didn't hit a 25, it was a net zero building. We didn't hit um, an EUI of 25, but we are in the process of reaching out to Eversource, right? With Kim, uh, Kimberly Cullinane and engaging them because this is a large, I forget the name of the pro program, but this is a large building. Yeah. program that we need to engage with them now to understand what's on the table. Yeah, she, she knows to look out for, for us. I've put her yeah. on, put this project on her radar. So she yeah. knows. And, She's and our BFF. Like, it's all. Yeah, 20, 25 is the number. So I really, you know, want to encourage us to, to shoot for that. And then, you know, similarly on, on targets, uh, you guys may have seen that yesterday, the straw proposal for the net zero stretch code came out and there are specific limitations contemplated 
for K-12 schools over 100K, which I assumed a school would be, that relate to the heating EUI units. So they established a, a TEDI, right? The thermal energy demand intensity of 2.2 KBTUs per square foot per year as the, the proposal for the stretch code. So if we're currently targeting 3.3, you know, I think we're going to have to bring that down a little bit to even be in compliance with what is right now the like the government's first salvo on, on the stretch code limit, uh, which, you know, is according to the regulatory timelines would go into effect January 2023. So like we, we would be underneath that. So I think we've got to push that farther. Um, the, the conversation around, you know, COVID and ventilation is... Uh, of course, top of mind for, for a lot of us here. And I, I wondered whether you all had used or had heard of the um, Inverid technology, which uses a sorbent technology to, instead of uh, accomplishing clean air through ventilation strategy or you know, kind of rather dilution strategy, it actually cleans the air using a sorbent technology. This is what they use like up in space and spacecraft. So. I don't know if you guys have used the Invera technology before, but they're a Boston-based company and, and doing great work. And I know some of their projects are school projects. So I would encourage you to talk to Christian Weeks and his team over there. Happy to make an intro if that would be helpful. Um, but the, the, the upside there is that you get the same clean air, but at a fraction of the energy cost. So again, this would help both with our energy bills and our EUI target if we could be smarter about how we clean the air and not just be dumping dilution in to achieve that healthy clean air. And then the last kind of overarching comment I'll make is just, I, um, I get a little pit in my stomach every time when we're having these conversations and I, I hear us place in opposition to one another, the concepts of efficiency and cost. You know, I heard early, early in this conversation, well, it's more efficient, but it costs more. And I just, I understand we're talking about first cost, but I want to be really sure that we're being precise for audiences and we're not setting up efficiency as oppositional to cost because it's not if you're thinking about from a lifetime perspective, right? So uh, I, I just want to encourage us to be really careful when we're talking about some of these strategies and them costing more. We are talking about first cost when we say that. And we really need to be keeping everyone's eyes equally, if not more so focused on lifetime costs. This is going to be a long-term asset for Amherst. And, and we don't want to like mislead people and say, oh, this green thing is just costing so much, right? Um, I think that's a really great thing to point out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I, I also like got a little bit nervous when I you know, heard that we were going to be providing visibility to the carve out on the geothermal costs and the PV costs, because while I appreciate that transparency and those are two big investments, the, the reaction that some people may have is, oh, look how expensive that piece is. Look how expensive that PV is. And so when we present those carved out dollars, we really need to do it tethering back to um, what, is, what is getting us, right? So if we're gonna present the cost of PV, we need to put it up against the 30 year cost of utility power that is the alternative. So that people see that that PV cost is gonna be lower than our 30 year utility costs on a lifetime perspective, right? Similar with geothermal. Yes, we can present the geothermal and people are gonna go, oh, it's so expensive, but we need to present it alongside a life cycle cost. Otherwise people are gonna go, oh, look at that green thing is too expensive, right? And by law be damned, we will not get the votes that we need to build the building that we need. So I just want us to be really careful when we're talking about the cost of net zero because we're setting up some dangerous mindsets that will end up causing us problems down the road. Thanks. I think, I think if it's okay, um, Jonathan, just to somewhat respond to that. Sure. We, you're, you're absolutely right in, in all your points, Sarah, and uh, we will be doing the life cycle cost analysis Right, so so it's going to tell you what your upfront cost is, but what you know the cost is over you know the lifetime of the systems and the impact it has. So so we will be making sure that that's abundantly clear, um, and we recognize how important 
all of this is to the community. And so the, the other component of this is, you know, cost is, is already coming up, right? And there are, what we're hearing um, is comparing it to where you were in for your last project. And, and how could the building be so much larger? How can, you know, so, so I think because this isn't the first time and that there's some history here that it's going to be our responsibility to explain the differences and the nuances of where we are today and how we, you know, why, why we're here today, right? So not only is there inflation and all these other costs, but look at all these other great things we're doing, which will improve your asset for the lifetime of it, et cetera. But um, we just feel, and, and we can have a conversation about how we demonstrate and share the information to make sure that it's not considered a negative, it's, it's a positive, but yet we are responding to information that's out there based on some, some history. So Stephanie has her hand up, um, Jonathan, and Rudy had had his hand up and I brought him into the room. I don't know whether he also has his hand up. <laughs> well, why don't we go with Stephanie uh, and then I'll give Rudy an opportunity to, oh, he did, okay. Stephanie, please. Uh, oh. your, your sound, Stephanie, you're muted. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, first, I want to thank Sarah. Uh, she actually covered two points that I wanted to, to raise, and one was certainly the utility incentive and bringing them in early. So I'm really glad to hear that's happening. Um, the second thing was life cycle cost. Um, but also, I want to respond to the history of the last building. At the time, the town did not have um, a goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. And the town council has passed that resolution. It exists now. Um, and I think to our Energy and Climate Action Committee's point um, that that needs to be a factor, that that goal needs to be a factor in the design of this um, building, especially because it is one that we will have for at least 30 years or more. So we need to make sure that it is online with meeting our goals for the town. So I just, when, you know, similarly to Sarah, I, I do get a little tense when I hear that the cost is you know, exorbitant or prohibitive. I feel like we need to find a way around that and that there's um, opportunities for bridging the gap of um, of sort of baseline costs for efficiency that, you know, there could be supplemental incentives or things that can cover the difference. So I just want us to not stop at that uh, barrier. Thank you. Ready? Uh, thanks. Um, on the cost issue, I, I'm a little concerned. I mean, obviously the EUI may stay the same whether you have a bigger or smaller building overall, but other costs are gonna go up if we build too big of a building. And it looks to me like this building is quite big um, compared to like what we were looking at for the Fort River uh, in feasibility study. If you scaled that up by number of students, you wouldn't get a building this big. So I, I hope we will go back and really scrutinize the program for the building and whether we really need 113,000 square foot building. Because that's, even if you've got a great EUI, you're adding to the number of uh, geothermal wells you're gonna have to have, uh, the number of solar panels you're gonna have to have to cover all that extra space. So I think that's one area where the cost has gotta be pushed back is the overall size of the building. Um, on the ASHRAE study that you guys noted, um, one of the things you didn't put in was that their recommendation for a target EUI was 19.2 as a starting point, if I read that other tables right. And I believe, Vimshi, you, you, Vimshi, you, managed, you mentioned that they made certain assumptions um, that got them to that 19.2, particularly on the operating and behavior practices and I wonder, maybe not today, but if at some point you could go through what some of those were, why there's such a big spread between a 25 EUI goal for us here and their 19.2 goal for a climate zone 5A school building. 
um, it might be useful to just see whether there's some other things we, we aren't looking at that they did. Um, third, I wanted to make sure that you, that the Danisco team got the info I sent about the Hawthorne parcel, which I think, you should, I don't know if that parcel, it, it abuts the school property. And actually, I think there might be a smaller parcel above it that abuts. And if we get into, uh, you know, issues about where to locate the geothermal, I wonder if we can talk with the town about uh, stealing off a, a little bit of use of that uh, parcel if we can. I don't know if that's already been programmed for something by the town, but I think that's important to take into account. And then for massing, um, I assume a three-story cube-like building would be sort of the best mass. And I'm wondering what the elevator, extra elevator costs will be. Do you still come out ahead with three stories? Um, I hope we don't have lots of little projections in the buildings that don't add much usable space, but add more surface area and construction complications, which as Rick added and as a former project manager, I, I've seen those little projections and stuff are often where you have, you know, leakage of <laughs> water and energy and stuff. So a uh, simple simple building, maybe three-story cube. I assume that's where you're going, but um, whether we come out ahead even with elevator usage on that. And um, those, are, those are the main things now is like, how can we get it down lower? A lot of other schools in Massachusetts and elsewhere in the North are down in the low twenties for their EUI targets. Um, some of them are operating at that. And Particularly if we're going to have a really big building, I'd like to see a lower EUI so our overall energy use is lower because um, we've got operating costs to think of and maintenance costs. And the bigger a building you build, the more light fixtures, the more floor space, the more of everything you've got to maintain. And that's costly to heat and to keep up. So um, I hope we'll look at that again much more with much more scrutiny. We're gonna spend a lot of time looking at how to save energy. Let's look at some time, time how to save space in this building. Thanks. Kathy? Um, I just had a quick comment to assure Rudy that the Hawthorne property information was forwarded to Danisco. It was also forwarded to the town manager who got, is getting his staff on answering your question on is that available or not. So thank you very much for sending it in so specifically and it it activated channels um at least within the town so i don't think we have an answer to that but it did um flag that so i want to thank you for that kathy do you see any other uh, folks in the audience who might want to come in or oh sorry you muted again Tried to mute myself so I don't make a noise. Um, there, Maria Capecchi has her hand up, so um, I can also just allow her to speak because that seems Maria. Um, you can unmute. I brought you in so you can speak. You're here. Hello. I think yes. All right. Hello. No, I'm I'm here. Okay. You can hear me? Okay. So I want to share both Sarah's and Rudy's concerns um, uh, about staying committed to net zero and staying committed to doing what this committee is, is, is tasked to produce in this building. And I, um, I am, I've heard some concerning things at the recent school committee meeting by some members um, who maybe don't quite understand the commitment to, to do this and that it does have everything that they will be um, deciding in terms of educational programming and how to meet those needs um, has an impact on your work uh, and both the school building committee and the net zero subcommittee um, because every, every change in square foot has an impact on cost and how we manage things from an energy efficiency standpoint. So uh, I think there, may need to, it may be a matter of explaining or uh, having people that are doing that work 
really understand the interconnections between the decisions that they're going to be making um, early in the process, which will lock us into uh, to different to size and scope of the project that as you're going to try to balance between the choices that you talked about. Likewise, I think we need to do that work now um, before we get locked into something that's going to make it uh, very difficult for you. And I, I want this to be a building. I don't want this to be uh, all aspirational. It has to result in a building, but to do that, we have to do something that we can actually uh, afford to do. Uh, there, there are real, real limitations from a lot of different angles, and we have to think of that holistically before we complete this early work. Thank you. Kathy, anyone else who might be in the audience with a raised hand? And Rudy, uh, you know, do you have your hand up still, or do you? Is Rudy, I think Rudy's yeah. hand didn't go down. I don't know okay. whether he raised, okay. So no, there are no hands that I see anywhere. Great. Well, I guess I'd like to circle back, oh, Sarah, before I continue. Sorry, if you, if you wanna keep okay. going, that's fine. I was, I was, if, <laughs> If we have time, I will offer more thoughts, but you, you can also tell me that you have more to do on the agenda, Jonathan. Well, our agenda is, I think we're, we're getting towards the end. So um, I, I'd like to complete the, the question and comment period and then just kind of circle back to Donna to make sure that, you know, if she, if she needs more explicit direction from the subcommittee that we, we give her that before we break. Um, so Sarah, you're good, okay. I think she turned, shook her hand down so we can get right. get our marching orders. <laughs> Donna, what, what more do you need from the, the subcommittee uh, this morning? Um, you've kind of presented a, a case for the, the 25 UI. Um, <clears throat> to me personally, it sounds like a rational kind of stake in the ground um, as much as I might like to do a lower one, um, but also understanding the, the challenges. Um, Tim, I, I don't know if you want to jump in. I... Uh, well, I was. I mean, a stake in the ground is 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 in fact what we are looking for. I mean, obviously, stakes move, and we adjust on all um, factors moving forward. Uh, but our decision making, our thought process, moving forward, you know, can see that twenty five as the target and make decisions accordingly. Um, you know, and as we get more and more developed information, you know, we will be continuously um, reassessing. But, um, you know, a statement of 25 as the target, yes, is part of what we need. And then just also uh, some sort of agreement that the process as we've laid it out uh, makes sense um, in terms of if there is anything else that we need to meet about before, give or take a month from now, um, please let us know. But otherwise, you know, the information that we talked about having um, at that next meeting, we won't have before then. So, uh, basically, confirmation of the target and the schedule as it relates to the entire project. Okay, uh, Rupert or, or Ben or Kathy, any kind of comment on that? Um, well, well, I wonder, Jonathan, do you need do you need to do something formal like? Yeah, like so I'm wondering, do we need to formally vote on it? Um, we I'm certainly to, can't do that. I'm willing to make a motion that we okay. recommend. We recommend a target of EUI at this point um, from the committee and have you report that up to the full committee. And, and then we could put the types of caveats Tim just did on it, but I would just separate that out that this is a starting point um, and it's needed for uh, doing this initial preliminary design cost estimating. Uh, so I make a motion that we recommend a target of an EUI of 25. Uh, Rupert or Ben, do you want to second that? Or I will comment second on that. that. Okay. I will second it. And I'll, I'll do uh, a, a roll call uh, kind of vote. Ben? And yes, I, etc. Rupert? Uh, Rupert, I. Kathy? Yes. And I'm also in favor. And, and then Tim, I mean, Jonathan is chair, but we can submit that recommendation and also, you know, 
between the two of us or Jonathan can pick out the charts that show the timeline, like what comes next. And we know, you know, the monthly, you gave us some ideas of what we're going to see at that. So we can do more than just this one line um, in a yeah. quick summary. Absolutely. And we're, we're meeting next, next week. Next, next Friday. Friday. So it doesn't have to be, and Margaret's doing minutes for us, Jonathan, if you want to capture any of this and we will get you the video. We're, we're trying to post the videos right after the meeting to the extent we can. Um, and I, Rupert's hand is up. Yeah. I just uh, would like some clarity on how we can assist next steps in terms of our expected actual occupancy. And I think it'd probably be important to, uh, uh, involve Dr. Morris in that discussion as well. I would agree. Uh, yeah, we've already reached out to him and, and we've, we've offered a schedule that we typically use as we need that information to produce the life cycle cost analysis and all that information. So I'm sure you'll be hearing from him, Rupert. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Not seeing or he hearing any more uh, hands or seeing any more hands up or hearing more comments. I think we may be able to to uh, wrap up today's meeting. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I guess I could entertain a motion to, to say we're done or we could just be done. <laughs> I, th I think you can adjourn us, Michael, okay. <laughs> Jonathan, unless you want to go through a vote. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, I, we, we are adjourned. Thank you all for all your efforts today. Thank you.